Good morning, everybody. This is going to be a rather informal session today. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a little less, little less sort of rigid and and regimented as uh, as my normal classes, but full of just as much useful information. We hope. So I'll um, I'm gonna start with some uh, some brief remarks just to sort of set the scene, and then pretty much everything else we do is going to be live demos and live Q and A. I want you guys to feel free to to jump in with questions as we work through this material. This uh, this new feature we're going to talk about today is something else. It is. Uh, all you have to do is get on YouTube and start looking through Photoshop educational videos, and you will find one teacher after another just like making the mind blown gesture. And they're all just kind of freaked out at this new technology. There's one guy that's this video I watched. He's like, it's four in the morning. I've been up all night. I can't stop. <laughs> it's really fun stuff to play with. It's really feels like something out of science fiction. So generative fill, that's what we're here to talk about today. Or, or sim what's that? Okay. Everybody with me? Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. So today we're going to talk about this new thing they've introduced called generative fill. They used to call it synthetic fill when they were developing the feature, and that's actually a pretty good description. So this is a new feature that's available to everybody in the latest beta release of Photoshop. It's not the official one, the regular one that they roll out, but they make the beta test, the one where they're trying out new features, they make it available to the public. So you guys, anybody with a Creative Cloud subscription can go into the software and download a separate version of Photoshop that is this new 24.6 that they're testing out. And the big feature, the thing that's got everybody excited and freaked out and having heart palpitations is this generative fill. And what generative fill does is it uses artificial intelligence to intelligently replace the contents of any selection that you make in an image in Photoshop. Generative fill is like content aware fill on steroids. It's a more responsive content replacement tool, and it can take into account things like light and the direction of shadows, perspective, depth of field, all sorts of stuff. It's pretty miraculous to see it in action. It definitely feels like something out of science fiction or magic. There's this funny meme that's been going around among photographers that says something like, yeah, generative fill makes Photoshop finally do all the things my parents always believed it could do. Because people had all these sort of magical beliefs about what Photoshop can do. I'll be honest, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. But I also have to say at the same time that so much of the hoopla that I have seen over this new technology feels, at least to me, like it misses the forest for the trees entirely. Yeah, Sure, you can make Photoshop synthesize unicorns and rainbows and spaceships and lasers, and that's all fun. But if you're an illustrator, it's all fun if you're an illustrator or a digital artist of some sort, but that's not what has me excited as a photographer. Because what really impresses me about this new tech from a photography standpoint is the ability to convincingly remove complex distractions from a photo and replace them with natural content that's derived from the image itself using AI. And the AI takes into account the direction and color and quality of light and the shadows that are cast by that light. It takes into account depth of field, perspective, vanishing points, patterns, textures, and more. This is way beyond just a clone stamp. It's really looking at your scene and trying to reconstruct content in a way that looks like it belongs in your scene. I have been able to fix images that for one reason or another were flawed in ways that made them difficult, if not. Yeah, all you people asking to record the meeting, it is all getting recorded and you will okay. be able to pick it up on YouTube uh, later on today. Okay, good. Okay. Let's see. You guys can unmute yourselves as needed. I'm just going to cut down some of the background chatter here. Um, so what I was saying was that one of the things that has me so excited about this is I've been able to fix images that previously were, 
Well, they were flawed in a way that made them difficult, if not impossible, to fix naturally. Either it would have taken me long, tedious manual labor work, or the fix wouldn't wind up looking natural. But now we've got this incredibly easy way to radically increase both the speed and the quality of these kinds of edits. And I want to show you guys a whole bunch of different examples so you can see how well it handles different image repair needs. I do want to say right at the start that I'm not here to judge the ethics of using this technology. I will note that when it comes to the art of photography, this technology can be used honestly, it can be used deceptively, it can be used creatively, it can be used exploitatively. That's up to the end user, of course. This is just a tool, albeit a very powerful one. But my focus today is on how you as photographers might utilize these tools in your regular editing, both for your professional work and perhaps for your more creative efforts and purposes. While we are on the subject of AI and ethics, I would like to point out that Adobe's Firefly plot project, the thing that lies at the heart of this generative fill technology, is entirely ethically sourced. What that means is that Adobe trained their AI model only on images that they had obtained the legal right to use. So this includes images that are in the Creative Commons or public domain licensed, as well as contributions that people made to Adobe stock with the knowledge they would be used to train the AI. Which means that once they release this feature officially, you all will be able to use it commercially without worrying about any sort of rights issues when using generative content. It is all ethically and legally sourced, and Adobe is going to actually stand behind it being copyright free if you use it in your work. They'll actually come to your defense if you get sued. This is a marked difference from generative systems you may have seen already, like MidJourney, which were built by scraping billions of stolen images and metadata from the internet without ever getting consent from the creators of those images, nor offering them any sort of compensation for the use of their work. In general, I do encourage you to support platforms and systems that build and train their AI models in an ethical fashion whenever possible. It's really a matter of respecting artists' rights to their own creations. And I really applaud Adobe for making this a focus of how they're building their tool and how they are building in other tools that will allow you to embed that sort of creator Im information with your images. All right, so that's what generative fill is, is it's this thing that's going to use AI to replace content in our images in a much more intelligent way than content-aware fill can do, uh, than clone stamp, healing brush. It really takes all of this to the next level. All right, so that covers what it is. Let's talk about, let's see if I can move my notes over here where I can see them a little better. Let's talk about how to get uh, this beta version of Photoshop. Um, all you guys already installed it yet, or are some of you waiting to get it? See, a, a bunch of people, I know you guys have been out there trying it. I know that a bunch of you haven't, and I have no idea where to find it. So we're going to make that really easy for you. Get my screen share going here. So here's where you will find the beta installer. Let me see if I can move this down to the bottom. There we go. So you want to open up your Creative Cloud desktop app. Oh, look, they've even got a little splash screen telling me all about their beta releases. So you can get, get it from the little cloud icon, which you'll find if you're a Mac user. Turn on my mouse highlighter here. If you are a Mac user, you are most likely to find this little thing up in your menu bar at the top here. It's this little cloud looking icon. Windows users, it's gonna be down here in your system tray, or you can launch the program itself. Once you've got the program launched, you can go to the apps tab here. This shows all the apps you have installed. And if you scroll down on the left-hand side here, you will see that there are a bunch of other categories here. And one of them is beta apps. 
These are beta test or early release applications. A beta test is just the name that they give to a piece of software when it's still in development and they want us to work out the bugs. So if you switch on beta apps, you will see that the first thing listed there, now I've already installed mine, but you'll have, if you haven't installed it, you'll have a little button here that says install, and that will allow you to install this latest release, which they've just updated this week. It's actually now 24.7. So it's even newer than the, the version that they put out like a week or so ago. So all you have to do is click the install button, and that's going to add the Photoshop beta to your computer. Please note, it does not replace your regular official Photoshop. So if I go back to all my apps here, you'll see that I've got a regular Photoshop here with the regular dark blue and light blue icon on it. And the Photoshop beta installs, let me go back to my beta apps, installs in parallel to it. It doesn't replace it. In fact, it gets its own set of preferences. It will pick up most of the plugins you have installed because these days plugins are installed in a place that whatever version of Photoshop you have can find them. It doesn't have to be in that Photoshop. But when it comes to your settings and your preferences and things, they're going to look like they're brand new when you open up Photoshop beta because it gets its own. So you go to your camera, or your Creative Cloud app. You go down to beta apps and you install the Photoshop beta. So that's going to get it on your computer. If you're like me and you're handing all of your photos off to Photoshop out of Lightroom, you're going to want to find a graceful way to integrate that new Photoshop beta with your existing Photoshop and Lightroom. Some people want to be able to use both. Maybe you want to use your regular Photoshop most of the time, but you want to use the beta when you're playing around with these new features. There's a way to actually have both of them installed at the same time. And the way that you're going to do that is you're going to do all of that in the external editor preferences. So I'm going into Lightroom. Windows users, you're gonna be under the edit menu to get to your preferences. Mac users, you're gonna be under the Lightroom menu. And when you go into preferences and you go to the external editing tab, you've got a primary slot and a secondary slot. And in the primary slot, I keep my regular Photoshop. Photoshop 2023, the official release, I think it's version 24.5, I think is the latest one. But in this second slot here, you can add extra editors. Like if you've got Photo AI from Topaz or Denoise or any of these, those get added, <clears throat> excuse me, as secondary editors that you can hand off a picture to. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to choose what app you want it to connect to, and you'll go browse and get the Photoshop beta. You'll tell it what kind of file you want it to make, like say a 16-bit pro photo Photoshop file, and then you'll save that as a preset. And if you do it this way and you save this little external editor preset, when you go to edit a picture, like right-click, edit in, you'll see that you've got your regular Photoshop here and right below it is edit in Photoshop beta. So you have a choice of which one you're gonna hand it off to. But they have made things a little bit easy for us. Because as it turns out, if you happen to have Photoshop beta open in the background, get that out of the way for a second. If you happen to have this open in the background and you go to hand a picture off with either edit in Photoshop, the regular one, or the keyboard shortcut for it, which is command or control E, Lightroom throws up a rather interesting message. It says, do you want to open this in Photoshop beta, which is already running? If not, please close it and retry. And so just because I have Photoshop beta open means that if I go to hand a picture from Lightroom to whatever Photoshop, Lightroom basically says, hey, you know, this one's already open. Do you want me to just give it to that one instead? And sure enough, I can just hit the button there and it's going to hand that off to the beta version of Photoshop, which I happen to have open right now. Any questions about getting it set up in Lightroom? I typically either add it as a second editor or I just make sure that it's open when I call up Photoshop from Lightroom and it's going to ask me, hey, do you want to hand it off to the already open version of Photoshop? I find that fairly handy. 
There are a few little odd glitches you might run into when you try and run this generative fill. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a little basic demonstration. Um, I'll show you a little bit about how it works. And then we'll talk about some of the gotchas that are involved. Basically, over the course of our little Q&A session here today, there's five practical uses for generative fill that I want to show you guys. And I'm sure that there are a jillion new ways to use this tool that we will figure out. But for now, there's five sort of fundamental practical uses that I can think of that I'm going to demonstrate today. Number one is the ability to remove objects from a photo, distractions, trees, power lines, all sorts of things that you might just want to get out of your photo and do it in a way that looks very natural. So that's removing objects. Number two is replacing objects, not just taking something out of a picture, but introducing new synthesized AI generated content into your image. We'll talk about using generative fill to expand your canvas to get a little bit more room at the edges. Maybe you just slightly cropped something in camera and you wish you had just a little bit more breathing room. Maybe there's a border merge you'd like to break up. So we have the ability to use this tool to actually expand the canvas and the AI will fill in the missing areas for us. I'm gonna show you guys how you can blend two separate images together and make it look like they're one picture. You can fill in the gaps between them, you place someone in a background, that sort of thing. And then the last sort of practical use that I'll demonstrate for you all is how to use this technique to make pictures that have that are seamless. So if you wanna use them as a panorama or as a tile or a repeating pattern, that you'll remove the seam that would have been obvious where the edges were. So let's just start with the basics. Let's start with how we're going to use this. I want to show you a few examples. Um, we'll just start with the live demo. So the thing that has me just excited and freaked out about this tool is the ability to just remove objects from a photo, objects that are distracting, and that once you're done, you'd never know they were there in the first place. So this is, this is a favorite photo of mine. This is a photo of my photographic mentor's granddaughter at her baby naming ceremony at a local synagogue. And the rabbi has this new tradition where she'll roll out the Torah and she'll lay the baby down right on the Torah scroll to do a blessing as they're doing the baby naming. And I got right in the central aisle. I'm shooting right down the middle at the bima, And I love the shot, but I have always hated the fact that the, the podium is in the way on the right-hand side. I find it a distraction. And if I had thought about it. I would have walked over there and moved it out of the way, but I couldn't. There was no way I could do it in the middle of the ceremony. So as much as I've loved this photo and the gesture and the light and all that, I've always been bothered by this little distracting podium. Well, now I have a way to remove it and to remove it naturally. It's really quite remarkable. So there's a new feature they've added to Photoshop that's in the official release as well as this new beta, and it's called the context bar. So if I go up to the window here and I turn on the contextual tax task bar, contextual task bar, say that three times fast, it brings up this little toolbar here. And this toolbar, the reason it's contextual is it's going to have different things showing on the toolbar based on the context that you're using it in. So if I have a paintbrush in my hand, it might have different things there if I have a marquee tool in my hand. In this case, it's expecting to make me to make some sort of selection. So a couple of things I'll tell you about this toolbar. Normally, it's going to show up underneath your image or underneath where you've made a selection. If I select this area, the toolbar shows up right underneath it. I find that having the toolbar pop up in different places is a little distracting. So what I do is I grab it by this little white line here and I take it up to the top of my screen or somewhere off on the side. And in the little three dots menu here, I pin the position of the bar. So now I've got a couple of things on this bar. I can select the subject. I can try and remove the background. I can make other choices. For now, I'm not gonna worry about the bar. I'm gonna pick up my lasso tool which I've given a very light feather of about eight pixels. And I'm just gonna make a lassoed selection around this distracting object here that I would like to remove from my scene. So tip number one is generally 
make a looser selection around the thing you're trying to get rid of. If you go right up to the edges of it, it's not probably not going to blend in with the rest of your scene as well. So I'm going to go ahead now that I've lassoed this, my little contextual toolbar, the first button now says generative fill. And that's where we're going to trigger the brand new generative fill feature. And when I hit this button, I get a box here and it says, describe what you'd like to generate or feel free to leave this blank. So in the situation that you're talking about, if I hover over this, it says, if you leave this blank, we'll fill the selection in with the surrounding image content. This is the way I am using generative fill most of the time. I'm telling it, generate some content here, and I'm leaving the text box blank. I'm not telling it to put something else in there. I'm just telling it to repair the image. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the generate button here without filling anything out. And let's see what the AI does. Not only is it gonna generate a result for us, it's gonna give us three variations that we can take a look at. And let's see how well it does. Here's the progress bar. This is all being, and look at that. Now, to me, that's pretty astounding how well it did. So that's variant number one. Here's number two, which probably matches the width of the background tiles a little better. Here's variant number three. Really, any of these are pretty darn good. So a couple of things I want to point out about the repair job that it did here. Number one, here's your original. Notice how it created some of these wonderfully wispy little transparent hairs here. Notice how it completed the end of the Torah scroll here that had been notched out by the piece we removed. We removed this little piece and the AI went back in and it completed this complete with the reflection. It got the light shining on the wood back here. It got the color and the tone and the texture of the background here. If I had submitted this image in a competition, I don't think that there's anybody who would have looked at it and said, oh my God, they've Photoshopped this look. You can see they've, they've replaced part of it. It's incredibly natural. Got a question out in the chat. Where is the contextual taskbar option? You will find that under the Windows menu. If you go up to Window, you'll find contextual taskbar all the way down at the bottom. If you're not seeing that, you're probably not running the latest version of Photoshop. Should be in there in 24.5 or higher. So that's a very simple example of what's gone on here. I do want to point out that the generative fill, the area that was filled, in fact, has a, this whole patch over that area. You can see where it brought in that little bit of the scroll. Pop over to the chat. Can you see all three versions in one panel? You can. Jana Shetley's asking about wanting to see them. You get little thumbnails. If you look over here on the right-hand side in the properties panel, you'll see the three <laughs> versions here. And there's little thumbnails for them. In fact, we may be able to make that now. I thought maybe we could make those thumbnails bigger. I don't think we can. But while we're there and while we're looking at these three variations, I want to point out for you the fact that Adobe has asked us to give them feedback about the results. So you will notice up here in the contextual toolbar, a thumbs up, which means, hey, I thought that was a good result. A thumbs down, I thought that was a poor result, and a little flag that'll allow you to report the results back to Adobe. You can say, hey, I thought this was going to fix my wall, but it looks kind of weird. And this feedback we give them on which of the results we like, and which of the results we don't like, helps to train the AI to be even smarter. So I'm going to give it a thumbs up on this one, and it says, thanks for the feedback. And there's a button if I want to tell them more. I can say, I can rate how well it did. We've got a little survey here, and I can add comments to it. And you can even choose to include image and layer data. So when they get the feedback, they can actually see at a technical level how their AI fixed your situations. So these little three variants that you see are in a new kind of smart object. This new smart object that has the generative fill has all three of these variants inside it. Once you've picked the one that you like, if you're trying to save space, you can go to the little three dots that are next to each of the other variants and you can rate it as a good or a poor result. You can report the result or you can delete that variant and that'll just make your file a little smaller.
I tend to delete the non-working variants. And if I wasn't happy with any of the three that Photoshop came up with on the first try, I could hit the generate button again here or up in the toolbar, and it would make me another three variants that I could look at and decide which one I like. Once I'm happy with it, I'm probably going to choose to um, flatten the image and save it back to Lightroom. I've already got this one done, so I don't really need to save it back. More questions popping up in the chat. Uh, yes, the contextual um, toolbar is definitely in Photoshop official release 24.5, but it doesn't have generative fill. Generative fill is only in the beta release. They're going to roll it into the main one soon, but right now you only get generative fill, but you do get that contextual taskbar or toolbar in the regular official release. What if the conceptual toolbar option is grayed out? That probably means that you don't have an image open. As in the case with mine, I don't have a file open, so there is no contextual text bar because there's no context that I am working within. So let's look at a few examples of this. So there, there you see the original file and there's the replacement file. This is the, one of the first things that I tried it on and I was pretty knocked out at how well it works. So here's a picture of your classic archetypal conical hat at a, at a brick kiln in Vietnam where we're waiting for these clay bricks to dry. And I made a loose selection around the hat. I did not make a real tight specific selection because the more that I have some of the overlapping area, the more that the AI is going to be able to gracefully blend it in. And I want to point out something about the replacement content. Here it is when the AI has removed it. Notice that in this picture, my focal plane was right here on this row of bricks. That's my critical focus. And as I get farther and farther back, my focus gets softer and softer and softer still. Notice how the generated content is following that. And it's sharper in this row and softer and softer as we go rows back. The generative AI, the generative fill command actually takes into account depth of field and shadows being cast and where the light is coming from. It literally looks at your picture, sees the direction of the light. And if it's going to add some shadows in there, they're going to be in the same direction. And as any of you know, who have tried to make composites before in Photoshop, the absolute hardest thing is getting the light direction correct. If you took my Photoshop core skills class, you might remember this image that I gave you as a homework assignment to remove the column, that metal pillar that's right in the middle there. Generative Phil did this in seconds. I made a marquee selection and it did a beautiful job of matching up the pattern of the shelves, right? This shelf right here, these lines were completely obstructed. There was no shadow coming off of the B. The booze bottles were blocked back there. And in the replacement, it did just a perfect job of filling in every one of these areas. It matched the uh, floor, <clears throat> excuse me, the pattern on the counter, lined up the chairs. This shot was taken last fall at the beautiful new House of Music in Budapest. And it's this incredible indoor outdoor venue. It's got these trees that go up through the roof. And it was hard to shoot even with a wide angle lens. And I loved this shot of the exterior of the building and all of the reflective glass, but I kind of wanted to get rid of this near tree, on the right-hand side of the scene. I made a loose selection of it with the lasso tool, ran generative fill with no text prompt, and boom. It did a perfect job of reconstructing the corner of the building here. It picked up more of this sort of green reflective grass. It filled in the trees that were supposed to be there. This just knocks me out how well this works and how easily it works. I'm literally lassoing or using the marquee tool or drawing around the area. I'm hitting generative fill and I'm giving no text prompt to the box and telling it to fill it in. This one, this next demonstration, this one drove me crazy for years. This is a, a church that's up at Buda Castle in Budapest. And I love the hexagonal tiled roof. And I was playing around with this idea that I'd love the pattern. And could I get rid of the spire? Could I clone it out using any of the traditional tools? I tried the clone stamp. I tried the healing brush. And in every case, 
because of the perspective of this image, the size of one of these hex tiles and the angle on the right side of the picture is not the same as the size and the angle on the left. So every time I would try and clone this little section out or this little section out, nothing would line up. None of them are straight lines. None of them are the same sizes. And I tried and tried. I even tried the vanishing point tool in Photoshop. There's a vanishing point tool where you can actually define a three-dimensional perspective grid and then use the clone stamp in perspective. And it'll make it smaller at the small end of the vanishing point and bigger at the big. Even with that tool, I just couldn't make it happen. So I thought, oh, let's see how generative fill does with this. Let's see how it did. Piece of cake. Just took it right out of there, very naturally replaced them all, scaled each of the tiles to match. Another example for you, I love this space that's up at the top of a department store in Venice, right above the Rialto Bridge. This is where you wait before you go out on the observation deck. But I hated the red velvet ropes and gold stands because they broke up the wonderful perspective grid that kind of makes this. And once again, I had previously made a version of this where I removed all that using the vanishing point tool and the vanishing point clone stamp. And it was okay, but it never really worked very well. well. As soon as I got generative fill in my hands, I wanted to see if it could fix this problem. Piece of cake. And look how beautifully it's preserved all of the vanishing points and the perspective that defines this floor grid before, after. It's just gone. Um, Jeff? Yep, did go right ahead. Select, did you select every single little stanchion and red rope to do I this? I didn't. I actually, I best? worked this one in pieces, and we're going to talk about how to approach breaking this down. I believe that what I did is I took out, I think I took out the right half rope here, and maybe I might have even taken out the whole front one first, and then I came back and did the side ones separately. And I'll talk a little bit about how to, how to do this in, in just a little bit in terms of breaking it down. In fact, I've got a demo where I'll show you that breakdown. This shot was taken last October in Saigon in front of the Opera House. There were a bunch of models and photo crews all around this location. There was a real bride and groom in the background here waiting to get their pictures taken. But these two up front leaning on the vintage car, they're part of a photo crew. And they had all of these people behind them. I found all of that very distracting. So I wanted to clean up that background a little bit. So I went in and I made some selections and I removed a lot of those distractions. And look at how beautifully it filled in the little motor scooter back here where those people used to be filled in the background here where we had a couple people, couple people back here, and they're just gone. Distractions removed. And I wasn't doing anything fancier than making a selection and then using generative fill without any text prompt. This is a bus stop in Vinales, Cuba. You guys probably saw this in the promotion for the, for the workshop today. I started Janice by removing just the guy in the middle with the blue vest and the red shirt. I lassoed him. In fact, we'll probably do this one as a live demo. And I removed him. And when I did, the AI was perfectly happy to fill in the bench and the back of the bench and the concrete and all the areas where his feet were. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. Let's take out another guy. And then I took out the guy sitting to the right in the shirt here with the green pants. And I lassoed him and I took him out. And the generative fill replaced the bench and the column and the concrete. Then I took this guy out next. Eventually, <laughs> I thought, let's see how far we can take this. I took out the bench. I took out the little ladder back here. I even took out the yellow post. So here's without the people, right? Before, after, look at how it has picked up the pattern of the background. It's kept the light and shadow and angle and texture of all the concrete. And it has very convincingly removed all those objects. If we want to go one step further, I went even more. And I took out that yellow pole and the little ladder. Let's go ahead and do this one as a live demo, and we'll see how we can build up to something like that. So I'm hitting Command-E. If you're a Windows user, you can hit Control-E. And it's going to say, hey, you've got Photoshop beta open. How about we just hand it off to that one? That way, I don't have to go in and manually tell it which version I want to send it to. Let's hop over to Photoshop. There we go. 
Check the chat for questions. Does Photoshop beta have to be online for AI to function? It sure does. This entire processing is all being done at Adobe on their servers. So you absolutely have to have an internet connection to use generative fill. What I will say is that there's also a new tool that they added to the regular version of tool that's called the remove tool. It's like that content aware remove we got in Lightroom. It does not require the cloud. So you can do it all client side. You can do it on your computer. I see people's heads exploding. I like the head exploding emoji. That's a good one. So let's go ahead and let's explode some heads. I am going to take a lasso and I'm just going to make a very non-precise selection of this guy. I'm actually going to grab that little padlock hanging there because I don't really want that to show up in the background. I'm going to make sure that I enclose the shadow that's being thrown by him. So where his feet are down here, I kind of want to get the shadow that they're throwing a little bit. We'll come back up here, get that little elbow shadow, and I come back around to where I started. I have made a loose lassoed selection. You may optionally choose to feather it a little bit. Sometimes that helps the blend work a little bit better. So I've got a mild feather of about eight picks here. I'm going to come over to my little contextual taskbar, and I'm just going to hit generative fill. I am not going to type out anything here, and I'm just going to say generate. We'll watch the progress bar as this gets sent off through over the internet to Adobe. Their servers work on it and send the results back to my Photoshop. Where'd he go? If that doesn't freak people out and blow minds, I don't know what does. Look at how beautifully it reconstructed the background and the bench that he was previously sitting on before, after, as if he was never there. Look at how it even got this little curve in the cement down there. That really does kind of blow me away. So that's our first guy. I can then come in and we can make a little lasso selection around our second guy. Now, the last time I tried this out, Photoshop did something very funny and they put the bench, they put this end of the bench behind the column and it ended up looking like an Escher optical illusion. We'll see if it does that this time. Go around the boot here. We'll come up underneath him. Go ahead and take out that little part. And I missed just a little bit here. So I'm going to add that little bit back in. All right, let's try it again. Generative fill, generate. So in this case, I'm working the image in stages because I feel like it really helps the AI figure out where you're trying. If I'm really trying to remove everything, oh, it put the bench in front of the column this time. Perfect. That's just a, a near perfect removal. And if I don't like the job it did, actually, let's check the other variants. That's variation number one. There's number two, a little more detail on there and a different sort of mounting post there. There's variant number three. I don't like number three because it put it behind the post. So I'll give a thumbs down and I can tell it more and I can say placed object behind foreground. And I can give them a little feedback. So I'm not going to keep that one. I think the first one was probably the closest to successful, the first or the second. Probably the first looks the best. And then, of course, we can go in and remove person number three. I can't see your um, your eyes glazing over because I can't see your... Uh, your little faces yet, but I hope that somewhere out there in the internet, you all are kind of quietly shaking your heads and freaking out a little bit over just how easy it is for me to just completely, naturally, believably, photorealistically yoink these people right out of my picture. Let's take feller number three, generative fill with no description in the text box. Here's our little progress bar. Bada bing, bada boom, gone. Everybody's at the bus stop. Bus came by and picked everybody up and they're all gone. That's generative fill removing objects. Pop back into chat. Can you change them to a penguin? Of course I can. Let's see. Mid journey had size restrictions. Does this AI have size restrictions? Yes, we're going to talk about that. 
Can you change them into a penguin? Of course I can. Does your feedback affect subsequent variants of the same picture? No, it does not. That feedback goes to Adobe's programming team and they use it to adjust the AI models. When the next version of Photoshop gets released, those adjustments are there. Thinking of the effects on photojournalism. So um, next month, I'm going to be giving a lecture for the International Photography Hall of Fame called AI and Photography Standing at the Crossroads. And I am absolutely going to address the issues that are involved with photojournalism and travel and nature shots where this kind of technique could be used to forge something that's photorealistic. Deep fakes have been democratized. Anybody can make a convincing fake now, and we have to talk about image authenticity and veracity because seeing is believing. And if I put out a picture that shows something and I claim that I took this picture and that it isn't AI based, um, I could easily convince people of that if I have a well enough done uh, picture. So yes, there are some major ethical concerns. We're not going to talk about those today. Come to the lecture next month and we'll talk about it deeply. Jim says, I think photography, as we know it, is going to be extinct. Everyone's going to wonder, is it AI? Will this work on any file format type? Yes, Anthony, it'll work on anything you've got opened up in Photoshop. If Photoshop can open it and you're looking at pixels, then this absolutely can work with it. A few more examples to consider. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Can I just jump in? I have a question about um, making selection, specifically on that shot of the wedding in Vietnam that you showed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, the figures were much more closely together, like the guy in the orange shirt that's right behind the woman sitting on the car. Yep. And it, it, do you still make a loose selection? Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Let me show you one of the ways that I approach that. So we have some other AI-based tools in Photoshop, and one of them is called the Object Finder. You'll find that in with the Quick Select tool and the Magic Wand tool. It's under the same keyboard shortcut of W. And if I pick up the Object Selection tool, AI is going to look at my image and it's going to segment it. And by segment, I mean break it down into this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and there's our guy back there, Ingrid. And so mm -hmm. what I did is I used the object finder to select that guy specifically. If I click on it, there we go. And I've got just him. So in that case, I might just very specifically remove that, but I also might go in right here in my little contextual bar. This first item will let me smooth it, expand it, contract it, or feather it. So I might expand it by like two pixels so that it gets in there into the wedding gown just a tiny bit more, and then I'll do the generative fill. So yeah, I might not use as loose a selection right there where he butts up next to our, our bride sitting on the steps. And that'll still preserve her little crown. Uh, you know what? It looks like it's part of the selection. And I lost the crown oh, there. Yeah. So what I would do, let's undo that. Oh, so while we're at it, we got that little dialogue that popped up that said, um, your generated content uh, may violate the guidelines for this for the use of this software. Typically, what that means is the AI thought you were trying to put something that had either nudity or violence or harm to others depicted in it. And those are against the terms of service. What I will say is it's been a little bit overzealous in that regard. And that's not, in fact, usually the case. So let me see, Ingrid, if I can get in there and subtract her crown out of the selected area so that so that she retains that mm -hmm. when I try and do a generative fill to remove the guy in the orange shirt who happened to be right behind her. But yeah, I could use that object finder to go in and find all. Yeah, there we go. And she kept her crown. Mm hmm. Yeah, so you really still need a little finesse in being able to select well. Well, this is one of the points that I'm going to make here is don't expect miracles. You will sometimes be pleasantly surprised, and it's really neat when it happens. But the truth is you often still need to make a few manual adjustments to get things just perfect. It's good. In fact, sometimes it is astoundingly good, but it's not perfect. It's in its early stages, and it's going to get better. 
but don't try and hit a home run with one swing of the bat. Every time you reach for that tool, you might need to work your removals or your replacements in little sections. And just remember this shiny new tool isn't the only one in the toolbox. You will do so much better if you use generative fill in combination with all of the other tools and techniques. So yes, everything you've ever learned about selections and layers and layer masking, it still applies. You're still going to need your manual Photoshop skills in certain cases. Hey, Jeff. Yes, go ahead, Jim. You know what I think is funny is it knew, like, before you remove the guy behind the bride, it knew that it was an O and not a D. Behind Isn't that her. incredible that it actually filled out the, the, a D. the rest of the Saigon Opera House? And the no, it said that's an O. <laughs> It's great. It's amazing. It is astounding how well this stuff works at mm -hmm. looking at the scene. And, you know, and look at how beautifully it's got the light and color and contrast and detail and tone. What does the bar next to generate do? Could you give some examples? Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk about that little tool. We'll all be talking about ethics and AI. Where is the object finder? Yeah, the object finder is up here in the same part of the toolbar with the magic wand and the quick select. So that's keyboard shortcut W or shift W to cycle between the three options. And when you pull up the object selection tool, it runs immediately on your picture and it starts looking for... Oh, I'm on, I'm on the layer here. Let me get back on my background layer. And here's all of the little areas it found. It found this guy. It found her, this guy, the car. Notice how it has dropped the two figures. It's actually segmenting the car by itself separately from the models. So yeah, I can get in there and I can grab each of these little guys and generative fill them away. So somebody asked about the other options that are on the generative fill bar. Let's take a look at them. So let's say I've gone ahead and I've used the object finder to select our groom over here and just clicking on it makes a selection out of it. Now that I've selected it, I've got a bunch of other icons here. The first one on the toolbar here is what you would have gotten if you went to the modify selection menu, if you right clicked on the selection. So I can modify it and I can select a border around it. I can smooth that outline. I can expand it to make it larger or contract it to make it smaller. And I can feather the selection to make the selection boundary be a little more transparent or soft. I can also turn on the select and mask workspace. The next one here, uh, the next one over will invert your selection. So everything that was selected becomes deselected and everything that wasn't becomes selected. So that'll invert that button. This next one here will transform the selection. So if you wanna change not the contents of the selection, but the actual outline itself, this will make um, a mask. This is the same icon to create a layer mask that we have down here in the layers palette as is the little uh, new fill or adjustment layer that's right next to it. That'll create a new adjustment layer. This will fill our selection. Here's our little uh, control for the taskbar. We can hide it, we can reset it, or we can pin it. And of course, we can deselect what we've already selected here. Now, depending on what tool I have and what state I'm in, different things are going to show here. Pop back in the chat. Where was the object frame? You have to have the object finder checked. Well, you have to have it, yeah, to, turned on, basically. What would it do to the letters if you remove the groom? Good question. My guess is the AI isn't going to be able to figure out what goes in there, but we'll try it out. Let's go ahead and use the object finder. Let's select the groom. I might go ahead and expand that selection. Let's say I go eight pixels at the edges to really make sure that we're going all the way around him. Let's ask our friend Generative Fill to do this. Let's not fill in anything. And let's just see how poorly it fills it in. Cause we're all like, oh, it's magic. It can do anything. Sometimes it fails spectacularly. And my guess is we're gonna get some gobbledygook in there. Yes, we got the Sabiak Oflof Holz instead of the Saigon Opera House. Let's look at the other variations. The Sadless Opatahos and the Sadnet Opera Law House. Now, what fascinates me, look at how closely even the wrong letters match the original typeface. 
we still have that little inline typeface that matches the original characters of which we just had a small handful. So yeah, it it's not perfect, but geez, it's really not bad. If you didn't look close, look closely, you might not notice that it said Sadnat Oprala. Good question there. Ah, but it also failed right here with that area. So variant number three is a fail. Variant number two is a little better. It stuck something kooky there. Variant number one, I must have missed something in my selection that it kept adding a little bit there. Hey, Jeff. Yep. Um, uh, Andy had a great question, which is if you put Saigon Opera House in the little chat box, you know, text, text box with the generative fill, would it get it then? I don't know. Let's find out. Let, let me make a better selection of the guy because I obviously missed a part of his leg. In this case, I'm just going to take the lasso tool. You can call me. You can call me Ted Lasso if you like. We're going to lasso this in. I don't think, I think that if I do that, it's actually going to try and generate a picture of the opera house. But I could try to say, let me make sure I've got all of him here. Can you say text? Well, that's what I'm going to try. Text that says Saigon Opera House. I don't know. <laughs> you know, here's the thing about this technology. It's so new that we're all learning things about it. And y'all can try some things and go, hey, have you ever tried this? Have you ever tried typing in this prompt or using that technique? So no, that didn't help. Let's Unless try the I variant. Saigon Opera House in Chinese. I've got, I, it's a little better. I got Sahon Orba House. <laughs> but yes, it may be trying to do something like that. So no, that didn't quite do it. I would do better to remove it, then go find a matching font and type it in there myself with the variant that we had. More questions popping up. Wait till it adds geotagging. If it doesn't already to locales where you are, it might be better at some of these. Yeah, I expect that's where it'll go eventually. Uh, let's see. I'm just popping here through the chat, making sure I've answered everybody's questions. All right, let's look at a few more examples. This stuff just knocks me out. Um, we've already looked at these folks. One, two, three. I used to give this one to my Photoshop students and tell them to use the healing brush to get rid of the graffiti because I want to get in there and just clean it up and we would all do this and we would use it as a practice image. You'd always end up with slightly mismatched grout or one of your bricks is a little short. In this case, I literally like lasso content aware fill, lasso content aware, or excuse me, generative fill, lasso this generative fill. And I would do it one sort of little piece at a time. And it just did a beautiful job of removing it all. More content removal or replacement in this case. It's really removal and taking out distractions. I wanted to get rid of the column, the pipes, the clay pot, the conical hat, the other column, gone. And it replaced it not only with, with content that looks the right color and exposure, it's the right amount of blur and out of focus. It's a perfect match. This was a funny moment. This guy had this, we were in Hanoi and this guy came up to us. He was really excited, wanted his picture taken. And he had this globe wrapped in plastic. And one of our other photographers goes over and convinces him to peel all the plastic off of it so we can see the globe. But he didn't finish the job and he left the plastic kind of around his hand and the base there. I made a lassoed selection just around the plastic in the corner of his hand. And I'll be damned if generative fill didn't put a perfect pinky in there for me, complete with light and shadow on the light and shadow side of it and filled in the rest of the base of that before, after. That's crazy. Uh, this is a shot. Reflection. Yeah. Oh, Oh, we'll talk. I'll talk about the reflections in a minute. It picked that up. It's smart enough to know reflections. When we get to replacing content, I'll talk to you about that. This is a shot that Commerce Bank bought from me. And I, I went back later on. I thought, you know, it would have been nice if I had removed, could have removed these um, national champion banners. They're cool, but they're sort of dated. Well, I just made a couple of little marquee selections, used generative fill, and generative fill did such a good job on these. It even carried the shadow from this ridge. Let's get those at the same size so we can see them. 
it carried that shadow right across where it should have been. It got slightly different, darker ones over here, slightly lighter ones over here. It did a beautiful match based on where the light was falling. You would never know those were there. I've played around with this in my Photoshop classes before with students, where if I want to clone the guy in the red shirt out, I have to define the vanishing point of this train so that if I clone something from over here, it shrinks down to fit here. Or if I clone something from over here, it expands to fit here. Generative Phil made easy work of that, and it figured out the perspective. It figured out exactly how big or small. I didn't have to figure any of that out. This one's a mind blower. So this one, I started by removing the two figures on the right-hand side of the staircase. And I once, once I got rid of them, I thought, well, let's see if we can take out the two in the middle here. Heck, let's just take everybody out of the picture. And I want to show you how much the AI was able to reconstruct on its own. The entire perspective, staircase, and wall. Yeah, it's a little soft right here where it didn't do a perfect blend of the wall texture, but to go from here where it's blocking those stairs and for it to figure out all of that stuff and to put it in perspective, that's astounding. Here's an outdoor shot on South Broadway. I just wanted to clean it up a little bit. Let's say you're a real estate photographer and you don't have time to get out there and mow the lawn or clean the trim the hedges before you do your shoot. I want to get rid of these little bushes here, maybe the sign and the post, maybe this stuff at the background. Lasso it all, generative fill, it's gone. Before, after, I took the light post out here, took the whole sign there, and look at how it filled in a beautiful tree there for me back in the distance. This is pretty simple, right? Select the area. And yeah, I probably, most of us probably could have cloned this stuff out in Photoshop. We could have borrowed a little bit of this and cloned it over and cl but we were going to get repeats eventually. We were going to run out of enough stuff to fill in all these areas. Generative fill has synthesized content here that matches the corrugated metal, the sidewalk, and the road. I did make sure when I made this selection to pick up the shadow so that that would get removed. Same with uh, the now you see it, now you don't chicken. Select the chicken with a lasso. Make sure you get the shadow and it's gone. This one, I tried to remove those two cantaloupes that are cut open and replace them with the full ones dozens of times using content aware fill, using all the other fill techniques. None of them worked until generative fill came along and it had no trouble with them. Notice the shadows that it's filling in here, where these things are down in the recessed areas, it's picking up and putting the appropriate light in shadow there. Crazy. Back to the chat. What else have we got? New messages. Are you limited to how many descriptive words you can use? Well, I don't know. We'll find out. My guess is that there's only a certain number of them that are going to be significant to the AI to process. At some point, when you go back over flattening and saving, yeah, I will. We'll talk about that for sure. These are good, and, and most of your questions are, are covered by the things that I have in the, in the Q&A stuff. Um, so here we've got a young man walking on a sand dune, and when I remove him, look at how the AI has actually taken this set of footprints back here and gone ahead and filled them in where the kid was blocking them. It's like, there must be more footprints behind him. If you or I were doing this cloning, we would have to be smart enough to look at the picture and think, oh, I'd better clone a little bit of the, of the footprints in that path. In this case, I asked it to remove the figure on the lower left, and it filled in the jeans, complete with this little crease in them, right? That, that little crease is barely suggested there at the top. There's a fold here and a fold here, but in the replacement, it just went ahead and filled it in, matched the brick, matched the bush, matched the perspective, matched the depth of field. If I present this photo, nobody is going to think that this figure was in it unless they were there and they knew otherwise. A relatively simple replacement in this case. We'll do a little Abbey Road routine with four of my photo friends. Now you see them, now you don't. Everybody knows the man in the red hat. Now you see him. Now you don't. This is one I shot for a magazine. It actually ended up running in the magazine looking this way. I always found the garage in the background to be a distraction. I just wanted a little more, you know, woods and trees. So I just removed it. This was when we shot just a couple of weeks ago at the Missouri State Penitentiary. It's one of my favorite setups there. But I wondered what it would look like if I removed this railing from the staircase 
and this railing right here. So I went in and I selected these areas, generative fill, removed them, gone. And then I decided, hey, let's expand the canvas so I can complete the top of the triangle here, that point. And I went ahead and I had it fill in the areas. We're going to get to expanding the canvas shortly. So those are all the ones I want to talk about out of that section, the ones where we're basically removing objects from a complicated scene. Do you guys have any questions about that? Do you want to see one more live demo? Check if anyone says anything. Yeah. Shit. Hi. Quick question. Yeah, so, far away. So um, if you could go back to the replication of the genes, can you yes. kindly zoom in to that pattern of those genes to make sure that that really, really looks great? Because you know how difficult that is when you're trying to actually mimic the, the pattern. I do. And, and your question brings me to something that I want to talk about here. You Thank can you. see, you can see it's it's pretty darn good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's it. I mean, that's that's workable, and you know, it's you can... it's very workable. But there is a dirty secret I need to let you all in on. <laughs> right now, generative fill is only capable of producing a patch output that is ten twenty four pixels by ten twenty four pixels. So if you ask it to cover a much larger area, that patch is going to be scaled up to cover that larger area. And as such, it's going to look soft. So a lot of people who you've seen who've like expanded these canvases and expanded them and expanded them. If you're not looking too closely, it looks fantastic. But if you zoom in, you're going to realize it's a little blurry and soft because the patch was actually at a low res. Right now, the workaround is to patch your image in little sections if you need it to be perfect full resolution. So yes, when I zoomed into this, I can actually see right here where it goes from full detail to blurrier detail. In the finished version, Adobe tells me it'll be a full resolution generative fill. But right now, we're getting a little bit of low res content there. Look, if you're doing it on the web or for screen, most people aren't going to see the difference. But if you're doing it for a print, you might have to work it in smaller areas to really get that fine detail. Thank you. Excellent question. And thank you for setting up one of my little my little tips for you. So let's talk a little bit about those prompts because we're next going to get, well, we'll do that. Actually, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let me get into extending the canvas. So you can expand the canvas, open that canvas up, select an area and ask generative fill to fill in that area. And I can't think of a better example than this really adorable shot I got of these um, bridesmaids. This was a bridal party walking in the French Quarter in New Orleans and great gesture and color and all that. But damn it, I clipped all their feet. I'm missing the toe here. This boot is barely on and I've cut off the boot right here. When I ran generative fill, I just expanded the canvas like an inch at the bottom and I ran generative fill on it. And it made a perfect match for her other boot. It put a little shadow underneath her foot here, and it matched the angle of the flagstone and the little crease between them. Before, look, there's no flagstone down here. There's no tip to this shoe. It figured out what that should look like. This was the number one variant they gave me. The other two variants were close, but not perfect. This is a, this is a great example of where, look, yeah, I used AI to fix this image, but is anybody going to really say, oh, that's cheating. You should have got it right in camera. Yeah, I should have got it right in camera. I wish I'd been standing a half an inch back and had gotten this. How much of this is my original photo and how much of this is AI? Mostly me with a little bit of assistive help from the AI. So I don't feel too bad about making a correction like this. I'm certainly not going to submit this in a travel or a photojournalism competition because I have, in fact, modified it. If I'm being honest, I should submit the original file. Here's another canvas expansion. This is this beautiful cathedral we went to in a Czech town called Kutnohora. And I loved the perspective. I loved it. It's very, very tall in this space. But I thought I didn't, I was at a, what was I at? I was at a 16 millimeter um, lens. And I wish I could have gotten even wider. So I decided to pull this into Photoshop and see if I could use generative fill to expand the canvas. Indeed, I could. The original photo is in there. It's in this sort of central area here. 
But man, Degenerative Phil do a great job of picking up all of the geometry of the lines and filling in the stained glass windows and really expanding the whole thing. I may see how far I can go with this. Another example of expanding a canvas. A well-known location at the St. Louis Art Museum. My hope is that when I expand the canvas here, the AI will be smart enough to pick up the perspective of the coffered ceiling, the perspective of the floor, the angle that the paintings are at. And sure enough, I can add all this fake content, this generated content, original shot, AI expanded canvas. It gave me a brand new Gerhard Richter in there. And it spread out the floor, it spread out the ceiling, and everything matches. The lighting is the same, the angles are the same, the textures are the same. A couple of more quick demos. Um, train station in Prague before, after. I added a whole row above and ones on the side. And I actually worked this one in 1024 by, let's go to 100%, in 1024 by 1024 sections. So it would have full detail in all the replacement areas. I wanted to make sure that the replacement content looked as good as the original content. So I had a little marquee box that was 1024 square, and I would move it and fill it in and move it and fill it in, making sure to overlap with the original image just a little bit each time. Someone says, oh, this is going to be my new bestie. Yeah, photo edit. This, is, this isn't going to change photography. It's going to change photo editing. Um, I know several of you were standing next to me when I took this picture of a tram in Prague, and I thought <clears throat> this would be a fun one to expand the canvas on. Let's get a longer tram and let's get more of the cobblestones. And it did a beautiful job of extending the building, the cobblestones, the fall off of the light. It extended the, the train there. Here's a shot from a rice terrace in Vietnam. Can we get more on the left and more on the right? You bet we can. And naturally. This one was taken from our hotel looking down at a traffic circle below. It's a bunch of long exposures all blended together. And I'll be damned if the expanded canvas didn't wrap the rest of the circle around, wrap the rest of the pond around, continue the park in its circular fashion. Much of that content outside, well, all of the content outside the original frame is synthetic. It's generated by generative fill. Here's uh, along the Arno in Florence, the original shot the expanded canvas. If I present this, is there anybody that's going to go, oh, that's fake. You can see the you can see the zipper up Godzilla's back. That's just a guy in a costume. No, it's pretty darn realistic looking. Regular shot, expanded canvas. Original shot, this is, I think, at Logan Airport in Boston at one of the terminals. And it went and kind of reconstructed the rest of the room for me. It got me my other walls and it's stuck in a floor another expanded canvas, and it keeps the angle, it keeps adjusting the angle of the light and the shadow across these little dimples as the new content gets created. Everybody knows the Cotton Belt Freight Warehouse down on the North Riverfront. I've expanded the canvas to complete the building all the way at the end here, and it sort of faded it off into the darkness. Here's a situation where I removed the content. I took away all the windows, and I cleaned up the graffiti. Let's take this one and let's go ahead and expand the canvas live. I'm going to send that over to our Photoshop beta. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. Let's open that canvas up. Actually, I'll just do it with the crop tool. Hold the option key down so it comes out on both sides. Let's see how far I can go with this. Now, if I were going to be doing this for print production and I were going to expand the canvas, I would probably do my replacement in chunks, a piece at a time to get that full res. Once we get the official version, my understanding is we won't have to do that. So I am just going to select, oops, let's try that again. I'm going to select an area inside the bounds here. And then I'll use that little invert button to invert my selection. Right now, my selection is getting the, the colored stuff on the inside. But what I want is everything on the outside, which I now have. It's a little hard to see, uh, with the exception of the box in the middle. I will say generative fill. I won't fill in anything in the text prompt. And let's see if it can expand our canvas believably. 
Sometimes you just need a little bit of extra room. Sometimes you need it. There you go. <laughs> it looks for all the world like a natural original where it was in shadow. It's still in shadow where it was in highlight. It's still in highlight variant number two. Variant number three. So you can use this to reformat an image from landscape to portrait or portrait to landscape. You can use it to just give yourself an extra tiny little bit of room that you needed to fill in an area. Um, so we can very easily expand the canvas. So McCool had asked about uh, flattening. If I know that I'm done with my little image manipulation here, I can go in and I can come into my layers palette here and I can flatten the image down. That's going to take the generative fill layer, this outer part, and it's going to mush it together with the, the bottom layer. And typically I'll do that when I'm done. So I'll just come here. I'll say image, flatten, also makes a smaller file because I don't have multiple layers. And then I'll save that back to Lightroom where we should find it sitting next to the original from which it derived. So here's our original and there's our expanded canvas. Pretty darn believable, but you can see a couple of areas where it wasn't perfect. A, it was a little low res because I was asking it to take that patch and cover the entire image area. So I'm going to bet that if we looked closely, that stuff on the edges would be a little soft. Now, sometimes it fails and it fails spectacularly. Now watch, in this case, it'll actually work for me. So this is a woman stirring soya pots in a, um, in a village outside of Hanoi. And I have tried a couple of times to get it to expand this canvas. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make a selection that overlaps a fair amount because I want it to be able to sort of see these little pots here. I'll invert my selection and I'll do a generative fill. Oh, actually, that's not what I wanted to do. Go back. Before I make that selection, let's expand our canvas. Take the crop tool. And we'll just move our camera. Let's go ahead and move it out a fair amount here. That's a lot of extra content for it to generate. I'm going to make a selection that overlaps my existing content by a little bit. I'll invert that selection right here, and then we'll do generative fill. Oh my God, it worked so much better this time. Okay, the last time I tried to do this, it gave me this, gave me this crazy assortment of just sort of random shapes. In this case, not only did it do a good job of replicating all the little clay jars and their lids, but it got the light. It got the lighting. It still got her more brightly lit in the center and more, more darker lit around the surroundings. Let's look at variant number two. Not bad, maybe even better. Jeez, I can't believe what a good job it did this time. There, here where you can see it didn't quite get it. It's a little more chaotic. There's some random shapes in here that don't really belong. But man, variation number two and number one were pretty darn good for, for the amount that we were asking it to generate. Now, if I were trying to do this at a higher resolution with the content, I'd switch my marquee to a fixed size of 1024 by 1024, and I would come in here and I would patch it out one chunk at a time. It's time consuming. And I think of somewhere I made a little action that'll sort of repeat this across an image, but you really can go in there. I have no idea what this will do in the little square and work it segment by segment. Oh yeah, it, it did a fine job. I can now take my marquee and I can move it up. We can add another one here. And if I were to zoom in here, these are all going to be just as sharp as the original content because I'm not asking it to take this tiny little square and spread it out over the entire picture. So if we zoom in here, notice how sharp all that content is. You cannot tell, except for the edges there, you can't tell where one begins and ends. So yeah, when this thing is at its full power and we're getting, getting full resolution replacement, I think it's a game changer for all of us who do photo editing. Another question in the chat. And it knew not to add an extra woman. Right, it did. It looked at all that content and said, I only see one person. I think mostly it's a pattern of these jars. 
So that's expanding your canvas. That's number three. Um, I want to talk about replacing objects now and include some tips. So in the case of this photograph right here, this woman was on a, a stage under stage lighting with a very dark background behind her. So she's very isolated. We can all see the direction that the light is coming from. It's coming from upper right, casting shadows down towards the lower left. I made a selection of her and then I inverted it. So I was really selecting the background and I asked it to go ahead and, and I, I filled in the text box and I said, dark warehouse. And the first thing the AI came up with was this. Mm -hmm. I want you to notice how it cast a shadow from her arm onto the wall that it placed behind her. This blows my mind. Because if I were doing this manually and I was pasting in that background, I'd have to come in and sort of hand paint that shadow. That shadow isn't in the original picture, but the AI is smart enough to look at the scene and go, we see where the lighting's coming from. We're going to go ahead and make the lighting match that so that the shadows fall, you know, 45 degrees down and to the left. That's astounding to me. In this case, I selected this musician walking in a street in Havana, and I, I didn't make a super tight selection. I, I made it a little bit loose and included a little bit of the background. So when I told it New York City Street, it blended it beautifully. Now we're in New York instead of Havana. I was doing some headshots of this guy. He, he may seem familiar to some of you, but we thought he was a little for, informally addressed for the occasion. So I made a lasso selection just under his chin and around his orange shirt here. And in the text box, I typed in tuxedo jacket and bow tie. And generative Phil made that. Look at the shadow that it threw from his chin onto the bow tie there and how it kept all that beautiful light and angle. In this case, we're in a really beautiful canyon in Iceland. And I thought, well, God didn't put a waterfall there. Let's us put one there. So I made a rough selection of this cliff face running down to the, to the creek here. And I just typed in waterfall. And look at how it is synthesized content that looks for all the world like it belongs in this scene. There is none of that thick greenery and stone work here, but it figures out from the rest of the picture what that should look like. And it puts a nice waterfall in there. Jeff, while you're in this, there was a quick question about yeah. where do you type that in? So can you do one live so you can show where that? Absolutely. And I'm going to do a bunch of them. In fact, let's go ahead and let's take this image since it's such a crazy one. Command E or Control E. I'm going to edit a copy of this. Don't want to edit the original. Thanks for pulling that question out, Don. I really appreciate it. Let's pop over to, for some reason, the Photoshop hasn't been bringing itself up to the front. So L for lasso, right? I've got the lasso tool in my hand. I'm going to make a selection of this sort of area here. Let's come down. Let's have it sort of come out to the water here. That should be enough. We'll just sort of run it back up the side of the hill here. Maybe we'll even have it come back to there. And I hit generative fill, and then I get a text box right here. And here's where I'm going to type in waterfall, and then I'm going to hit generally. Because in the situation where I was removing objects, I'm not filling that box in with anything. But in a situation where I am replacing them with synthesized content, that's where I have to type it into the little text box here. Then I'll hit generate, and let's see what it does with this. And it may require a little bit of fixing from us. This took, this took me a couple of tries to get it decent looking. And some of them look terrible. That's not too bad. It put a little, it put a little uh, retaining wall down here. Let's see what version number two gets us. That's pretty natural looking, where it falls down here and has a little outlet to come out to the water there. And this leads me to something I want to talk about. The size and shape of the selection that you make really helps tell the AI if you're making generative content where it's replacing something, you are telling the AI not only how big you want it to be, but in some cases, what orientation? Is it laying down? Is it standing up? Is it facing this way? Is it facing that way? 
Um, so let's go back. That's actually not, not bad at all. <laughs> That's a pretty impressive. Let's go ahead and flatten this one, save it back to Lightroom. Here's the demo image I want to talk about in terms of how the selection shape you make affects things. So we're going to take this picture taken in um, Barcelona at one of the, um, the uh, Gaudi parks. So I can ask generative Phil to put a bicycle in this picture for me, but the size and shape of the selection that I make is going to tell generative Phil some clues about where I want it and how big I want it. So if I take the marquee tool and I make a box, oops, I'm still stuck in my fixed 1024 one. If I make a little box at the back of the frame right here and I type in the generative fill box, bicycle, it's going to make a small bicycle at the back of the picture that fits within that frame. In fact, it's going to make three of them and I'll pick the one I like the best. So there's bicycle number one. Eh, it doesn't look very natural. Two, three. Let's say we go with three. It's even throwing a little shadow there. So that would get me that bicycle. But if I were to make that box larger and nearer to the viewer, let's say I put it here in perspective, in size, if I fill in bicycle here, Make sure I spell that right. It's going to make me a larger bicycle because I'm giving the AI a little bit of assistance. I'm not just saying, I eh, just slap it in here anywhere, any size. I'm saying, put it here in the image and make it that size. And that is a much, notice how it put it the front tire behind this column. That's the stuff that knocks me out is when it actually does 3D stuff like that. That one's pretty realistic looking. I've got a nice shadow coming off of it. I've got a sense of depth because it put that front wheel behind this column, but it put the back wheel in front of this side. That's all synthesized content. And if I wanted it to be um, sort of looking face on to the bicycle, I might try making a shape like that. And I have no idea whether this is gonna work or whether it's gonna look horrible might be the wrong size, but maybe this gets me a bike that that's facing towards me, that I'm looking down the bike instead of at the side of it. Yeah, that it did exactly what I thought it would do. And because of the shape that I gave it, it could basically fit a that's pretty good looking replacement right there. So pay attention to that. When I was working on some practice images for this demo, I was playing around with this um, olive oil bottle that was sitting on my table last summer. And I just wanted to put a little mermaid in it. And I ended up making a selection that kind of showed uh, the generative fill, the shape that I wanted that mermaid to be. And I kind of put an oval right here. I might've even drawn a little wider tail. You do not have to be much of an artist to do this. So if I take this picture, let's go ahead and practice this again. And let's say I want to put a shark swimming around in my olive oil. I'm going to pick up my lasso tool and I'm going to try to draw a shark. I'm not much of an artist. I'm going to put a tail here and maybe a fin here and maybe a big shark mouth here. Let's, let's give this guy a dorsal fin on the back, right? I've done this really terrible drawing here. And I'm going to hit generative fill and I'm going to say a great white shark. And what I'm trying to do is give it a clue what size and shape and direction I want my shark to be swimming. And sometimes it's absolutely the opposite of what I wanted, but sometimes it helps it figure out the size, shape, and direction of the shark I want it to fill in. Now, you'll notice in this case, it looks like it's sitting on top. I could play with the opacity and now our, now our shark is inside the olive oil a little bit more swimming around. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. If once you have the shark there, can you, tilt can you move him? it around? Can What's you that? Move, I was just going to say, can you tilt him in a direction? Like I want him to be, you know, facing up more toward the bottle or do you have to do that in the original thing that you draw out? Well, you can't very easily because the the fill that it made is actually this entire section here. 
You can see my original drawing there. So yeah. if I were to try and move him, in this case, you can see the background moving with it. Sure. Now, what I could do, what I could try to do is flatten the image, get one of my selection tools, like say the object selection tool. It's not finding that. Let's try the quick select tool instead, make him a little smaller. And I can try and make a selection of my shark here. And again, it's going to be a little hard because he's so, yeah. so tight in there. Um, I could also try, let's try, um, I don't think select subject is going to work. Nope, that gets me too much. Um, but I can use the object selection tool in the rectangle mode, and I can draw a little rectangle and say, find the object inside there. Yeah, okay, we got him that time. Now I, I can move him, but the way I'm going to move him is I'm going to use a tool called content aware move because I don't want to have to fill in the hole that I leave behind. So if you go here to content aware move, I can now move him down to the bottom. And when I hit return, it should go fill in the area I left behind. Didn't quite select the tail very well. All right, let's see what we've got in chat. Does it understand words like toward or away or front or back? If you draw a portrait box, would it be writing towards you? Yes, it would, Karen, you're correct. Where are you telling it to use a certain background? We'll get to that one in just a second. Um, so let's talk about the kinds of things that we can put into those text boxes when it asks us to fill it out. So the number one thing I want to tell you is generative fill does not do instructional prompts like fill the area or create a scene or remove the lamp post and 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 turn the shirt blue. Instead, give it descriptive prompts with nouns and adjectives. So if I want see what scene we can play with here. Yeah, here's a good example. So I took this picture. There's my pal Kevin in the background there. And I'll show you exactly how I made a modification of this one. I am going to use the circular marquee, elliptical marquee if you prefer, and I'm going to use it to make a selection of this uh, beautiful round brick window. And I am overlapping those circular bricks because I want them to be part of my replacement. In my generative fill, I'm going to say something like circular Victorian window, nouns and adjectives. And I'm going to hit generate and let's see what it does for us. I could have said um, red and gold stained glass window, nouns and adjectives. That's what it's looking for. There you go. <laughs> Put in a nice replacement window. There's a variant number one, variant number two. Ooh, fancier. Variant number three. And look how it's even throwing a little bit of a reflection into the window panes. So that's that's your first clue. Um, it, it has to do with how you interact with that box. If you've been using mid-journey and stuff like that, you're used to giving it all sorts of crazy instructions. Just give it a descriptive prompt of what it is you want it to place there. So for example, if I have, let's say this picture. Hmm. Now, we were talking a little earlier about the fact that it's smart enough to recognize um, things that are reflections. So if I make a big sort of, just make a big lasso right here. And I select that and I say reflecting pool. I could probably just say water or puddle or even mirror. Not only is it going to create a reflection of the lighthouse and the things that are above it, but if you had something that the reflection could have sort of seen underneath, It'll try and synthesize that. So there it is. It's made a little reflecting pool and it's picking up the fence and the house and the lighthouse. Let's see our three variants. That's pretty natural looking. There, that's even better. I really like what it did with the far edge of the little reflecting pond there. We can come in here and we can make a little lasso selection of this area. Let's go ahead and take this all the way out here. Maybe we come up 
here, and I'm going to say something simple like a flagstone path. All right, generative fill, generate a nice walkway for me. This one sometimes comes out great and it sometimes comes out terrible. That's not bad. <laughs> it's really not too shabby. Here's version number two. Oh, that's kind of cool. And I could see clipping this part out and sort of working with this part, making a slight change to it. That's terrible. That looks like concrete. So I'm gonna give this one a down vote. I could tell them more. Concrete instead was generated instead of stone, which was used in the prompt. And the programmers read this stuff and they go, oh, okay, well, we need to make sure that we know the difference between flagstone and concrete. So I yeah. think that, yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to ask, so like say in this shot or, or even when you replace the bicycle shot, uh -huh or insert of the bicycle. So say you had a picture of you on a bicycle, maybe either on a different layer or maybe even on a different file. Can you instruct it to replace the bicycle with you into the AI photo so then it looks like you're actually there? Like, we're not we're not quite there. What you're talking about is is a little more in the the realm of compositing. What I might be able to do is I might be able to go ahead and put me on the bicycle into the picture, and then I could maybe replace the bicycle or replace me. But it's not going to sort of auto composite for us, at least not okay. yet. It might. Yeah, it might. Okay, it does you. seem to know. It does seem to know verbs like bird flying versus bird walking. Yeah, if you guys have experience working with these prompts, please feel free. So the very first one that I did was of my friend Kevin sitting on a bench with his camera in front of him, and I just circled a little area in front of his camera, and I typed in, um, "hummingbird flying facing right," and it put a little hummingbird right in front of his lens. Very realistic one at that. Let me see what other tips I have for you guys in the replacing stuff. Like I said, selection shape can play a big part in getting the results you want, the size and the orientation. So for example, if I, um, well, let's just, uh, let's close this image and pick a different one. Let me go back to, oh, we'll take this one again. We'll take the Gaudi shot. If I just put a box or an oval here and tell it to fill in a person, it's probably going to put them standing up. Like if I ask it to put a, um, if I ask it to put a cat here and I make it like this, I'm probably going to get a cat that's laying down. If I make it a little taller, I might get a cat that's standing up. If I make it like this, I might really get a cat that's standing up. But if I actually draw out with the lasso tool, Let's say if we put a tail here and a body and a head and some ears, right? I'm a terrible artist. And the body, and then I bring it back around to the tail. Sometimes you can, that's enough to tell it, cat. And if I want, I could say sitting. And will it put the tail in that little area? I don't know. Sometimes I just kind of give it a rough shape. Sometimes I get a little more detailed. Sometimes it works better. Sometimes it works worst. Definitely in development. Oh, there we go. There's our cat sitting down on the ground there. There's cat number two, cat number three. They look pretty realistic, maybe a little bright. I might, you know, dim him down a little bit, but it definitely picked up on that shape that I gave it, where I put the head and the ears and the tail wrapping around there. It absolutely took that as a clue. So if I come in here now, we're really going to get abstract. I am going to put a head a shoulder, an arm, a body, a leg, another leg. I mean, we're doing stick figures here, people. This is not, this is not fine art. Oops. I'll do that. And then I can say, um, be careful about putting like kids and other stuff. Every, every time I try and put like a child uh, with lollipop, child with lollipop. And sometimes it'll be like, no, 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 you're not allowed to put children in your pictures. You're violating our terms of service. We'll see what it generates, whether it's capable of giving us a child with a lollipop that fills that little 
horribly drawn, drawn stick figure, I'll be damned. <laughs> right? Doesn't that just crack you up? <laughs> and they are standing where I put them, basically in the shape that I drew out. But their faces are messed up. Oh, look, if we get in close, you're going to see some horrifying things. There are some of that generated content, particularly the low res stuff, looks like. Do you remember that that painting that the woman tried to restore herself? It was called Eke Homo, and it ended up looking, Jesus's face ended up looking like a little monkey. You end up with, with things that look like that horribly distorted little monkey thing. But yeah, if I want a, a bicycle and I really want to control it, I could draw the wheels. You know, I could draw the wheels and add a little bit for the, for the, you know, sort of the body of the bicycle there. And if I ask it to put a bicycle in there, we're pretty sure where, what orientation it's going to put it in. But we saw earlier that wasn't really necessary. The box alone was pretty much enough to do it. Hop over to chat wall. Can you control the resolution of the generated content? Not yet. You can't. Eventually we will be able to. Not yet. Right now, it's everything, any patch you make gets output at 1024 by 1024. And if it's a big patch, that information will be scaled up to cover the entire area, which is why I'm generally working on smaller things. Let me look at some of my other tips and tricks here. Even a rough sketch that is the right size and quote unquote facing the right direction should get you better results than just a box or an oval. You're just giving the AI a little clue as to what your intention is so it can do a better job of realizing that for you. Sometimes a feathered edge works better than a hard one. Sometimes it's the other way around. It all depends on how much you want to blend with the surrounding area. So when you're selecting an object or an area, the difference between a precise selection and one that overlaps a little bit can have a big impact on how the replacement content will be blended with an existing image. And somebody also asked about background, so I'll show that as well. Um, let's go to, let's go to, oh, we'll stay here where we were in replacing objects. So we'll start by a, uh, by demonstrating this one. So I'm in Photoshop. There is a remove background button. That's not the one I want. What I really want to do is select my subject and it got her. And then I'm going to invert that selection. Now I've got the background. It did include this tiny little gap in her eye, eyeglasses that I don't want. Actually, you know what? We'll let it go ahead and fill that gap in. We'll go ahead and let it put that in there. Normally, I would probably excise that from my selection. So what? someone got a suggestion for where we'd like to put this woman. Last time I put her someplace, it was in a dark warehouse. In front of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, Eiffel Tower. Great suggestion. No idea what it's going to do, big or small. There she is, standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. Those aren't fabulous, because there's a there's sort of a, a scale proximity thing going there. Let's try something else like a library. Let's put her in the library. I suspect with an interior to match the interior shooting, the lighting will be a little bit better. Yeah, we can ask it to synthesize all sorts of stuff, but the farther and more disparate the elements are, that's a lot better. Notice how once again, it has cast her shadow against the replacement background, right here at her hip, right here at her elbow. Let's see the other variants of this. I don't like that one as much. That one's not bad. I think the first one's probably the best. And sure enough, it has placed her in this room and matched the existing lighting. Karen says, Hawaii. Have you tried running an image through Topaz Photo AI after using this feature to improve the resolution? I have. The problem isn't that the resolution needs to be increased. The problem is that 
parts of the picture are at a lower resolution and softer because they were generative and parts of the picture are at the original full resolution of the camera. So yeah, you might be able to selectively go in there. My experience has been that the results aren't particularly good. I'm waiting for the official version to come out <clears throat> because I think it's going to yeah, be a lot. Jeff, a I, lot. Did, I did take that that iPhone image that was given to me of the yep. Roman Coliseum after I took all the people out, I changed the sky. I ran it and sharpened it just a little bit. And it probably it, looked better. It looked a lot better. And and I was, I was still surprised that again, that was an iPhone image that was sent to me in a text message. And they right. said, can you get rid of the people? I thought I did a fantastic job. So someone has asked me if I can make the live, the, the background be farther away from her. So we can say, I'm going to try distant library or distant bookshelves. I don't know. Can it do distant? I don't know. Let's find out. Good question, Bonnie. I'm, I'm learning every time I run one of these, I learn a little bit more about what it's capable of. So yeah, Kevin sent me a demo of a picture. In this case, it didn't get distant. It basically ignored that. Can you say bookshelf farther back? That doesn't, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to make sense of those. Oh. Um, yeah, so I could try a, a darkened library. <laughs> See if that'll help give us a little figure ground separation. Mm. So I was going to show a precise versus an imprecise selection. No, for some reason, it really wants to put it right next to her. And that may have to do with how it's reading the geometry of the original image. And it sort of figured out how she's standing there. Definitely not going to hang on to that one. Let's go back to, let's talk about replacement content with this guy particularly. So I can select my subject pretty easily. Boom, I've got my subject. I can invert my selection. This is a very precise selection here. I can invert that selection. I now have a complete background. Everything has been selected right up to the edge of this guy. And I can say um, Times Square, New York Street Corner. And what it's going to do is it's going to replace the entire scene behind him. It's not going to take any clues from the existing environment. It's going to replace the scene entirely. The blend isn't quite as good as I'd like it to be down in the feet here. It has, it is goofed up at the hands. There's a lot of things about this that didn't work when I made that very precise selection. Now, if I just take my lasso and I make a loose selection around him that, yes, picks up a little bit of the background so that the AI can figure out how to reconcile the difference between this picture and the newly generated content, I think we're going to get a much better blend. And I'm going to go ahead and include the little shadows underneath his feet. Zoop, zoop, zoop. Make sure I'm getting that hand. We will invert this. So instead of selecting the subject, we're selecting the background. I'm going to use the exact same text prompt. Um, Times Square, New York City, street corner. And what it's going to do is it's going to see that little white road stripe. It's going to see the curb back there. And it's going to reconstruct a scene that kind of has the same perspective and geometry as our original. But it's going to substitute. Look at that. OK, he's still walking down the street. The street still recesses away from him, but it took the existing columns and it replaced them with something new. Now, if we get in close, we're going to see that there is some weirdness going on with the elephant man over here. And these people, they look a little strange. Some of this content at low res looks a little bizarre. Let's look at our other variants. There's number two. I don't know what happened to this poor man's arm. There's number three, not too bad. And if you don't look too closely, the stuff in the background looks naturally. But if you look too closely, it gets a little weird. So that right there shows you the difference between when I made a precise selection and asked it to replace content and when I made a looser selection where it could blend things in a little bit better. In general, you can combine the text prompt 
and a specific shape to get the generated content that you want. You can also change the selection intensity to blend transparency. So when I did the little mermaid in the bottle of olive oil, when I made my selection, I basically, I went into quick mask and I painted with like a 50% brush. So it was only 50% selected. So when it came back out and generated content, it was already semi-transparent. You could also just go into the layer mask when it's done and paint with a, a slightly gray brush to introduce a little transparency. And that's how I was able to make her look like she was floating in there. And while I was at it, I got rid of this little thing down here, these little bits on the side, some of this stuff at the back. I just wanted to get rid of those distractions and put my little mermaid gal in there. Here's a little bit more um, replacement content before, after we put a little ballerina up there. Here's my previous version of replacing the window. Here's a beautiful spiral staircase in that same cathedral that we showed the expanded canvas on. And I just ran around asking it to add extra windows around the staircase. And look at how it matches the depth, the angle, the direction of the light, the three-dimensionality of how these things are cut into the side. All four of these other windows are completely synthetic, and they're a beautiful match for the original light, texture, direction, shadow, et cetera. Uh, this one was kind of silly. I made a tiny little square box right on the shoulder here, and I said sitting angel or seated angel and it put this lovely little ceramic figure up there for me before, after. You know, it's a tiny little thing. And in this case, that thing's probably small enough that the resolution is nice and sharp there. Yeah. And look at how it cast a little shadow. The AI was smart enough to look at my picture and say, sun's above, shadows are below. Here's the direction of light. Let's make sure when we add content, that it has a little shadow beneath it. This stuff just knocks me out because I've done this stuff by hand. I've gone in and I've cloned and replaced, and I've tried to make sure that the perspective lines up and that the patterns don't get broken and that all of this other stuff is perfect and the AI is so much better than I am. Can you generate an entire background and then add your image and mask out the existing background? Of course you can. Of course you can. I can take an entire, let's go over to Photoshop. Let's make a new document. Let's make this um, 10 inches by 8 inches. I'm going to make it at a low resolution for now so our, our material looks a little better. I can select the entire thing, generative fill, um, jungle. Put me in the jungle. Okay, I'm in the jungle. A river runs through it. How about I just come right through here? River. Actually, let's do uh, rushing water. Let's try that to see what we get. So yeah, you can completely generate new content from scratch to um, add you know, one of your pieces into. I'm gonna talk about the legal issues. Yeah, that's not bad. I'll put a little, actually put a branch in there. Odd. Um, let's put a uh, flying saucer silver with red lights. I don't know. Go look at chat questions. What will generative fills place be in camera club competitions? It's really going to be a challenge for any kind of camera club competition. Um, my feeling is that uh, it's it's fair game, of course, in any kind of open digital or open color. But if you're talking photojournalism, photo travel, or nature where image authenticity is key, then no, that should be prohibited. Unfortunately, the results are so good, you're going to have to have some pretty pretty eagle-eyed judges. I want you to notice that in the replacement UFO I placed up here, it is picking up reflections of the green underneath on the bottom mirrored side of my UFO. We could put a, you know, a shaft of light and a cow being kidnapped in this photo if we would like. All right, we're getting out into the weeds. Let's look at some comments. Oh. When you do fill, can you put, point to a place in the photo from which Photoshop will generate, as in the skins of the cantaloupe? 
So you can't do that here. You can do it in content aware fill where you can actually give it areas to pick from and forbidden areas where you don't want it to generate from. In this case, I don't believe you can seed the content like that. What I can tell you is the AI is pretty good at looking around and figuring out what it is that you wanted. Will we be able to download the recording? Will we be able to see it on YouTube? It'll be up on YouTube on my channel within a few minutes of this session finishing. You guys will be able to come back and watch it anytime you like. All right, I do have one more technique I want to talk about and a couple of little tricks I want to pass on. Let's see. Oh, this is important. So generative fill, when I do a generative fill right now, you notice I've got three layers, right? I've got my empty background layer, then I added my jungle, and then I added my UFO. And if right down here, I put an elephant, watch me draw a really terrible elephant. Elephant. When generative fill creates content for you, it does so from a merged version of your image. It basically temporarily flattens it all. It looks at all the layers together. So this, look how it's taking into account the fact that I put that guy in the jungle and it's given him two trunks and that's a little <laughs> creepy, but it's taken into account all the other layers. So it is it's important to understand that. So you can keep doing generative fill and it won't just look at this layer or this layer or this layer. It's actually looking at all of them as if you had flattened it. So that leads me to one extra tip, which is um, disable any adjustment layers, uh, curves, levels, color overlay, all, disable that stuff before you do generative fill, because it's going to take that stuff into account and you're going to end up with weird results. You can turn that stuff back on when you're done, of course, but disable it. I did mention the low reduced resolution, so you might have to work in chunks. That's most of the tips and tricks that I had, but there is um, one more technique that I want to show you guys, and then we'll uh, leave the remaining time for a full-on Q&A. So there are all of the sort of adding new content. It's fun. It's a little gimmicky. I can see some situations where it might work if the quality were better. One of the downsides of Adobe training its AI model ethically is they didn't have every picture on the planet to use as a base. So some of their generated content sometimes comes out looking a little wonky. I'll just, that's that's just the, the the reality of it is that some of the stuff it makes is a little funky, but I'm not typically asking it to add content. I'm just asking it typically to remove objects in a realistic fashion from my pictures, to just take them out as if they were never there to begin with. And I can do it. I can remove these flowers and content uh, uh, generative fill will not only replace these this wood and all the little gaps, but it'll take out the shadows. Everything will line up. It'll just be a little low resolution if I try and do it all at once. So another technique that I want to show you guys, we'll get to the other one last if we time, is the ability to blend together two completely different images. We'll start with an easy one. So I'm going to take both of these pictures and I'm going to right click and I'm going to say, open these up as layers in Photoshop. I want them both in the same Photoshop file together, just as separate layers. And I am gonna send this over to the beta, which I've left open the entire time. Now I've noticed that when you're handing off layered files from Lightroom to Photoshop, sometimes it gets it wrong and it only loads one layer. In this case, it got both layers. Okay, so I've got two layers here. I've got this one and beneath it, I've got this one. So let's go ahead and turn off both layers. Zoom out here a little bit. Let's expand the canvas. And I am going to go, we'll do this in percent. Let's just make it, I don't know, 250% wide. So now I've got a lot more room to work with. That doesn't seem like 250, maybe it is. Maybe that's 250%. Let's turn our layers back on. I'm gonna take the bottom layer I'm gonna move this over to the right here. I'm just gonna slide this out. Well, let's put it about there. I didn't really need all that extra canvas. 
So I want to blend these two images. I want to make them look like they're one picture. And all I have to do, grab the marquee tool, make sure that I'm picking up a little bit of overlap from each of these edges and ask it to do generative fill without a text prompt. And it's going to find a way to bridge the gap. Ah, now this looks funny because I was on the wrong layer. This layer should be on top and that looks much better. There's option one, option two, looks pretty darn, darn good. Option three, you can pick whichever one of them looks best to you. I'd say probably option two. And for all the world, that looks like a single seamless photograph, right? If we zoom in, you really can't tell where one begins and the other one ends. It's figured out how to match up the bricks, how to blend the bottom there. So that's a fairly easy example. This one's also a fairly easy example because these two pictures basically have the same horizon line in them. So if I try and match them up, open them as layers in Photoshop, this is just warning me that, that um, Photoshop is using, using a newer version of Camera Raw, doesn't matter. And here's where it didn't. Oh, nope, it did. It did get both layers. Thank you. Thank you. Let's zoom out a little bit. Open up the uh, canvas. Actually, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Open up the canvas a little bit. Let's take this layer. Let's move it out over here. Let me go back up to the top layer now. Pick up the marquee tool, select an overlapping area between the two pictures, and ask it to generate the missing part. And yeah, in this case, look, it should be easy for the AI. We probably could have done this with a little bit of cloning at a, at a low percentage, a little bit of transparency, but the AI makes easy work of it. It just blends those two pictures right together. That's even better. Let's see what number three looks like. So you pick which version you like. So that's a relatively easy example. Let's get a little more complicated. Let's try, let's try these two. And let's edit these as layers in Photoshop. Send it to the beta. Open it anyway, even though it doesn't have the latest camera raw. Both of our layers have loaded up here. They're on top of each other. Here's one. Here's two. Let's expand the canvas. So let's see, that'd probably get me enough there. Let's take the bottom image and move this over here. Make our canvas even larger. Let's really fill in some content here. All right, let's take that entire area between the two, make sure I'm on that top layer. You'll notice that at the edge of our picture on the left, we've got a woman in a floral outfit holding a basket. Is the AI smart enough to put a whole person in there? What do we think? Yes. I need the Jeopardy theme music to be playing while we wait for the progress bar to go. There we go. Uh, turned her from a man to a, a woman to a man. Let's look at the other variations. <laughs> a little distorted there. I've got a I've got a, ver a, a baked version of this I can show you back in Lightroom. Um, that's the best version that I got out of it. Where it filled in the gap at the market here. These are two, two completely separate pictures. And it's gone and filled in the gap for me. We'll do an example where we're going to start simple and get a little more complicated. Now, if you had given it a text prompt and said, a uh, woman in floral, you know, add woman in floral, would, would it have come out better than just allowing it to do its own thing? Uh, it might've been better. It might've been worse. 
Honestly, sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Are you deleting the additional samples created and flattening before saving? Typically I am, unless I want to retain editability. I'm flattening these files back down, which tosses away all of the extra variants. Are you dragging the photo over or doing a copy and paste? I've actually sent them over as two photos stacked as layers on top of each other when I handed them off. I'm doing that right here. So when I am in Lightroom here and I take both of these photos, instead of doing edit in Photoshop, I'm going all the way down here. I'm saying, open these two pictures up as layers on top of each other. That way I don't have to monkey around with getting them into the same document. So these were, um, this was a family and they were all harvesting coconuts. They were actually de-husking them over these very sharp blades. And they had several family members lined up in a row. And I kept sort of moving down. So I was standing right in front of each one of them. And so I got these pictures that are, that don't really sort of match. I've got this lady and I've got this lady and they're two really separate images. And I'd, and if I want them to all look like the way the scene looked where we had this row of people working together, this is where I would open up the canvas. And in this case, we will go ahead and make it 250% wide. That gives me room for the other picture and for a little space between them. I'm now taking the other picture, the one that's hiding underneath here in the layer, right? And I'm taking the move tool and I'm moving that. I'm on the wrong layer. Taking the move tool and I'm moving this picture all the way over to the right. Turn this back on. And I'm now going to use the marquee and I'm going to select an area between the two. And I'm going to make sure that I take out that pole that's there. We'll get a little bit of the coconuts at the front here. and We'll get a little bit of the coconuts in hers. Generative fill, no prompt. And let's see if it can bridge the gap between these two images. We do have similar foreground, midground, and background objects. Our scale's a little off, but they're basically the same. And it oh, threw some bananas in there. <laughs> Look at number two. Number two is pretty good, but it messed up the foreground. Number three is not bad. It added a pull back in there. So I might just do something like the following: flatten the image down, select this area right here and remove it again to another generative fill right on top of it. And to the casual observer, this looks like a single picture I have of two figures. The background matches up, the foreground matches up, the midground matches up. It's really pretty decent. Now, what I might like to do is to add one more fella to the to the the picture here. And this guy, I'm a little tighter in on him, so he's a little bigger. The light's a little different. So let's go ahead and let's send him over to Photoshop as well. Let's bring him, let's open up this canvas a little bit more. Crop tool, open up the canvas a little more. Oh, it's giving me the wrong background color. Uh, let's uh, flatten and turn that into a regular transparent layer so we don't get a big red background. I will now bring in figure number three. In, and in this case, I am bringing it in as a separate file. Now, he's a little too sort of big. So what I might do is I might shrink him down a little bit. Oops, let's let go of the shift key. So that he's basically the same height as them and kind of in the same position with the foreground and the background, maybe not quite that small, maybe somewhere in there. And I can actually come in here and select this area and this area and this area and this area and ask it to fill in all this, all that area that's in the clear, right? All the stuff that's in between him and the rest of the picture and see if it can go ahead and blend together all three of these images and make it look natural and realistic. Probably needed to do something about that pull, but honestly, that's pretty good. That one might be even better. And yeah, if I wanted to, I would flatten this out. Hey, here's your bonus tip. There's a brand new um, remove tool that's in the official release of Photoshop. That's also in the beta. 
You'll find that up here with your spot healing and your healing brush and your patch. And it's the remove tool. And I can literally use it to just paint over something. This is kind of like kind of like a generative fill or a content aware fill at your fingertips, except it's not. It doesn't send it out to Adobe. It's all done on your computer. So I can just paint over that pole right there. And it'll remove that area and replace it with fairly natural content. Little bonus tip. All right, what kind of questions do you guys have about this? Where are you getting stuck? Are y'all kind of freaking out, having fun with this? It's crazy, like super crazy. When I when I took those red ropes and gold stands out of that Venice picture, you don't understand. That had been driving me crazy for years. And now I've got this perfect picture, the same one with the 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 baby naming ceremony for Stuart's granddaughter. I just, that that little copy stand or podium, it was always in the way. I love the shot. It's gone now. Does that, you think Stuart cares if I took that out? You faked that photo. That's not a real picture of my granddaughter's baby naming. Who cares? I took the distraction out of the way. This isn't photo journalism. I'm not trying to pass this off as a cover photo for National Geographic. I'm not trying to submit it to a nature competition. And then the last- say- Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I would say one thing about the person who asked about Camera Club, and I know not everybody on here is, is involved in that, so I'm going to make it very brief. But <laughs> if you have, it, in Camera Club, your picture has to be your own. If you're going to use a texture and you're going to mold, a, you're going to combine a texture or a composite, those pictures have to be your own. So if you're generating fill and that is not your picture, then technically that is not your picture. And she's right. Unfortunately, this technology is massively blurring the lines in all sorts of ways. Because if I'm using the generative AI or I'm using content to wear fill and it is replacing content based on my existing image in the first place, is that the AI or is it assisting me in repositioning elements from my image? I, I would I would not want to be a camera club judge moving forward. It's it's <laughs> going to make people absolutely bonkers. And I'm the one that they're going to send the picture to and they're going to say, hey, was this photoshopped or not? And I have to try and there is software out there that attempts to determine if there's AI generated content in an image. But right now, the 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 AI that's doing the generating is much better at fooling the AI that's trying to detect the generated content. There's going to be this cat and mouse game with authenticity and veracity. And that this is just the new reality. The fact that there's a tool in my hand that I can use to realistically put a gun in someone else's hand, that's a challenge. Jeff, I got a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um all the techniques you showed us today are pretty much replacing uh, content that existed or adding it, whatever the case may be. I'm wondering if there was a way maybe somewhere down the road this tool could do something like improve focus in an image. So instead of having to do focus stacking with four or five images, could AI somehow be used possibly. It, it can, but it's a, a, AI, AI can do that. It won't be a generative fill thing. I can tell you that Adobe's larger AI project called Adobe Sensei, which they've been working on for decades now, that there are many goals that they have. And one of them is definitely increasing the sharpness of an image. They're using the techniques that NASA is using to improve deep space images, to bring out more detail, to make them look sharper, to increase depth of field. So what I can tell you is I can use this technology right now to decrease my depth of field, to make parts of it look real shallow, uh, but increasing depth of field is going to be a lot harder because that involves actual synthesis. So, yeah, I hope we see that. Make it look like I know what the hell I'm doing. The ideal AI prompt. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. I think that is an awesome suggestion. Make me a better photographer. <laughs> other other questions about the techniques. We didn't have time. There's one more technique I was going to show you guys. And it basically, it's the same as what I just did where I merged images together. And it's where you can take a picture and make it seamless. So you could turn it into a repeating pattern or tile. Or those of you that took my photo creativity class, you remember that tiny planet technique where mm-hmm. we would wrap, we would take a 360 degree panel, we'd wrap it around so the ends connect and make a little planet out of it. 
Well, if you don't have a full 360 degree pano, you can shift your image over so that the two edges are touching. And you can select the chunk out of them and blend that away. I could probably do that as a quick demo before we, before we take off here. This is in seamless panoramas. So we will do this since I've got some of these people in attendance. We'll do this with this picture I took out at Innsbruck. I'm going to send that over here. This is a silly little technique that I love playing with. Um, to make these little tiny planets. When we're done, we're going to get something that looks like this, a tiny little planet where we've wrapped this little panorama around itself and connected the You're two. You have to share your screen. Oh, it's a good thing I'm not sharing it. You can't see all my mistakes here. <sighs> okay. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Let's get that going again. Where's our little Zoom guy? Thank you, intrepid students. Okay, you can see the screen now, right? Yes. So we're talking about starting with this source image right here. And the technique basically glues this end to this end and wraps the whole thing around in a circle so you get these little planets. I took this image from Burano and I blended the two ends so that they would match together and I made this little planet out of it. So let's go ahead and I'll show you this technique. <laughs> so the first trick is a couple of my friends standing on a a little beach somewhere. The first trick is I have to fix the blend between the two ends of the picture. In order to do that, I'm going to use a filter that you guys have probably never played with, filter, other, offset. And I'm going to wrap my image around. In this case, I wrapped it around by 5,000 pixels. I'm literally just wrapping the image around itself. I can now take my marquee tool and I can grab this middle section here. Let's go Let's go from like here to here, maybe even into the water a little bit. And I can just ask it to generate a, an area that just fills in that scene. Because once these edges match up, I can slide this thing left or right, and it'll always be a completely seamless pano. That's not bad. Let's see how the other ones did. There's number two. I'm going to go with number two. That one looks pretty darn natural. So let's go ahead and flatten this down. Now I'm going to do the three steps of this silly little technique. And by the way, there's a two minute video up on my YouTube channel where I show how to do the tiny planet technique. And I do it with a picture at St. Francis de Sales Oratory. So let's go ahead and do this. I am going to change this image so that it is a square, just as tall as it is wide. I had to unlink those two. I am going to rotate the image 180 degrees. I am going to run the polar to rectangular, the polar coordinates filter. That's going to bring it back around itself. And then the last thing I will do, just to make it really clear what we're doing here, is I will mask this off so you can see the area that we actually worked on. Somewhere in there, mask you off. Let's put a black background behind that. And the last thing I might do is I might rotate this around so that the people in the picture are standing upright. So what I the, where generative fill came in is right in here where the pano ended. I would have had this hard cut and I wouldn't have had a natural transition to get back around to the other side of the planet. So I've got my little planet in the middle with a little lake in it and a little island and my sky. And it's all wrapped around itself because I used a generative fill to clean up that overlap, that seam right there at the edge. I have used it to take a picture like this one and turn it into a seamless texture that I could then repeat over and over again in an image. And you wouldn't see little lines where it matches up with itself. So those are the five techniques that we talked about. We talked about removing objects. That's my number one, using it the most of the time, lasso it or select it, hit the generative fill button and don't type anything into the text box. We talked about extending the canvas. Excuse me, that's the wrong one right there. We've extended the canvas a number of different ways. We replaced objects where we did type something into the text box and I said, take this little thing and put a ballerina in there, or take this one and put a circular Victorian window in there, or put a little mermaid inside my olive oil, or put a little angel on the shoulder of my other little angel. We looked at, the last thing we looked at with this idea that you could take 
a pattern or a texture and make it seamless so it could be repeated. Here's a number of other tiny planets that I did. Here's the original shot, which did not match up on both ends. And once it did, there's a little tiny planet and it looks for all the world. Here's where the seam was right down here. You just don't see it anymore. And this is nice because not everybody can shoot a 360 degree pano. So when you want to try and make this technique and you really want your planet to come all the way around, you have to fake the gap right there. Uh, this picture likewise in Venice was turned into this little tiny planet by blending the areas that didn't really come together. Let me pop into chat, see what questions we've got. Just some thanks and comments. All right, looks like people had to bug out. Any other questions? No. Everybody got it downloaded now? You making crazy pictures? Yeah. Please send me some examples of what you do. If you remove something complicated, send me a before and after. I want to see like, what was the crazy thing you got out of the picture? I've taken a chain link fence out of a picture. I'm shooting through the fence. I took the time to select the chain links and it removed them entirely as if the fence had never been there. Send me your synthetic stuff. If you put, you know, lasers and spaceships and unicorns and rainbows in your pictures, hey, send that too. I want to see it. I want to see your canvas expansions. And if you guys come up with new ways to use these tools, I want to hear about those too, because I'm convinced we haven't seen the end of the long list of things that are possible. But for me as a photographer, absolutely the ability to remove that complex stuff, to get that podium out of the way, to get those red velvet ropes out of the way, yeah, to remove the steeple and have every little hexagonal tile be perfectly in proportion and scale. I tried and I tried and I'm good at Photoshop. I'm really good at Photoshop and I failed to naturally and successfully fix that one. All right, I'm going to turn you guys loose. We went about 15 over today. Look for the video to be on my YouTube channel. If you are not a subscriber to my YouTube channel, I encourage you to subscribe. There's a little bell you can click as well, and it'll send you notifications anytime I post a new video. This helps other people find my tutorials. You can just search for Jeff Hirsch Photography on YouTube, and you'll find my channel there. And if you're not on my regular mailing list, go to jeffhirsch.com, sign up for that mailing list, and you'll get announcements of workshops and classes and trips and good stuff like this. So have a great weekend and uh, do some generative fill. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Bye, guys. Jeff.